Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Voice of Authority webinar brought to you today by Apex Airspace. My name is Toby Fox, and I'm the Managing Director at 3Fox, the marketing agency for councils. Our job is to keep our network of councils and developers and investors and their influencers and advisors connected. And during coronavirus, we're doing that through a series of webinars that provide councils with a platform to discuss their ambitions and challenges and influences and issues of urgency. Next week on Thursday at 11 a.m., we'll be discussing the future of the Great British Town Hall with our friends at Inner Circle Consulting and renowned architects, Rogers, Sturk, Harbour and Partners. You can register for that at www.thevoiceofauthority.co.uk. But this week we're focused on council house building strategies, uh, specifically on seven frontiers that are being explored as part of what, have, I, until I'm told otherwise, I'm going to describe as the UK's largest house building programme by a council in Southwark, uh, with councillor Leo Pollack, who's cabinet member for housing at Southwark Council. And we're going to see how appropriate those measures are and what other innovations are being executed by Cardiff City Council with Council Member for Housing and Communities, Linda Thorne. And focusing in on one of our frontiers today, we'll hear from rooftop housing specialist, Philippa Prongay, uh, Executive Director at Apex Airspace on how her firm is disrupting development, but in a good way. But first, we've presented over the last few months, a number of sessions uh, looking at how councils are implementing the current government's policies and responding to its plans. And we thought our viewers would be interested to hear the opposition's view of these new frontiers of council house building. And so we're absolutely thrilled to welcome today the Shadow Minister for Housing and Planning, Mike Amesbury, MP. Mike, what role would councils play in delivering the homes that we need under a Labour government? Play a, a crucial role, Toby. Well, Larry, I can't make policy on this webinar today. You know, it's not, not very long ago. It seems a long time ago now, given obviously the current um, um, national and international health pandemic, but not long ago we had a, had a general election and we put forward a, a, a bold manifesto. Unfortunately, we didn't win that general election. Um, um, we have a, a, a very um, strong conservative government with a, an ancient majority. So our focus really is is the, the here and now and providing that effective challenge and scrutiny to the current executive, the, the, the current government, who have a, an ambitious target of delivering um, 300,000 homes a year and not meeting that, that, that target. Our real concern as, a, as an opposition, which is mirrored by, by stakeholders, and I know the, 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 the good people on this, on this webinar as well, is um, in regards to the shortfall of what we class as genuine affordable housing, so houses for um, for social rent and, and, and council housing. Um, if we look at uh, various figures that are banded about, there's almost a consensus there, whether it's the, 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 the LGA or uh, whether it's uh, shelter, the recent Heart of Homes campaign, to various so anything from 90,000 to 100,000. In order for the government to meet that target, of, 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 of 300,000, well, the answer's there staring people in the face, isn't it really? Staring the government in the face. If we look at the figures last year, um, I think it was just 6,000, less than 6,300 homes for social rent were built. If we take our minds back in, 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 in history, right up until the 1980s, successive governments of, of a variety of colours delivered, it was a, an average of 126,000 houses for social rent, um, predominantly um, council built, up until, up until 1980. Um, and then things have drastically, drastically changed. We look at the consequences of that. I walked, um, my flat's only 15 minutes from Westminster. I'm speaking to people from Westminster, my office um, at this moment in time. And I'm now starting to see the vis visible consequences of uh, housing policy by successive governments over a, a considerable period of time. There are far too many people living on the streets, which again, I'm starting to witness despite the, which, which was a, 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 an ambitious and briefly successful program of, of everybody in. Unfortunately, we're starting to see 
um, um, a considerable number of people out on the streets now. The other people, um, it's around 90,000 living in um, temporary accommodation. And something that shames us all as a society, 129,000 children um, that are now um, homeless, which is unacceptable, unacceptable. We have 1.2 million people on um, the housing to need registers, and yet we've only had 6,300 uh, social homes built last year. It's just, it's just wo 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 woefully inadequate. So yes, that's got to be an essential, an essential part of the mix. We would argue the affordable homes program, um, um, you know, considerable investment going in there, um, um, 12, 12, 12 billion pounds going forward, but it needs to be reconfigured. I mean, the definition of affor uh, uh, affordable housing at the moment at 80% market rents is well beyond the reach of many of the key workers. We've rightfully been clapping in the not too distant past on, on Thursdays, and we'll probably start clapping again in, 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 in any time soon, given um, the current um, COVID, COVID crisis of rapid numbers. Um, in, in increasing. Um, so that's going to be our, 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 our response. It's holding the, the, the government to account. There's a number of uh, um, reforms coming downstream as well, which I'm sure we'll touch upon maybe in the, in the questions, um, um, which re relates to um, certainly the challenges of delivering council housing with the necessary infrastructure when you look at the planning white paper, for example. Um, and building safety is another another big issue, which will have a, a, an impact on, you know, the new generation of social homes now and now and in the future. Okay, but I'm looking forward to the rest of the discussion and open to questions. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mike. Much appreciated. Okay, uh, viewers. Uh, we are going to open up the floor to questions uh, later on in the session. So start funneling them through to us uh, through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens, please. Um, but over the next uh, 20 minutes or so, we're going to hear uh, from Southwark and from Cardiff. We've got some uh, superb presentations on some genuinely innovative and fascinating ways in which councils are boosting their uh, delivery of homes. Uh, and on that note, Leo, no pressure uh, whatsoever. Um, it's over to you to fascinate and intrigue us with your seven frontiers of council house building. Thanks, Toby. No pressure at all. What I thought I'd do is just give um, an overview of what a council house building borough like Southwark um, is doing um, and the, the ways in which uh, councils like us and like Cardiff uh, are really leaning into the problem and trying to create the capacity where we get back to councils being major house builders in their own right. Um, as Mike alluded to, you know, the last time uh, this country was delivering the numbers of homes uh, that people needed that were genuinely affordable and secure and high quality, um, councils were major, major players um, back in the, the post-war period and even in the interwar period as well. Um, and what we've seen in recent years, certainly with Grant marginally improving, um, certainly in London since the election of Sadiq Khan um, and since the lifting of the HRA debt cap, there's been a mini renaissance in council house building and I wanted to just give an overview of where we've got to um, and given the peculiar starting point that we have in the 21st century with the land trading system as it is the way in, in an inner London borough we have quite built up areas um, what the, the potential front is for council house building might be some of the things that we're looking at and that's my old job title as well I clearly have <laughs> I'm a cabinet member just for housing um, cold all those words um, so the backdrop in Southwark is growing housing need. Uh, we have, I think, uh, over 14,000 households now who are on our housing register. It's really spiked um, during uh, the pandemic. Um, obviously a growth, a huge spike in unemployment. Um, and we're kind of um, facing this high prospect, particularly if uh, the private rented sector uh, support from the government isn't forthcoming of, you know, tsunami of, of evictions and potential homelessness presentations. We we're already seeing homelessness applications going up a great deal. We have over 3,000 children growing up in temporary accommodation. And in spite of everything we're trying to do through the planning systems, securing as many social rent homes as is possible, we know that the fundamental uh, 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 countervailing force that we can uh, provide is, is, a, is a house builder in our own right with an explicit 
uh, mission to maximise the overall supply and proportion of high quality social housing as far as the programme viability allows. And this is all in the context of incredible unaffordability. A two bed average rent um, is over £24,000 a year, um, which is two thirds more than the average individual salary in our borough um, and over half uh, the average household salary in our borough. Um, and sales prices are, are um, out of reach for the vast majority of our residents as well. So I wanted to, before I get on to the, the, the seven frontiers, I wanted to sort of talk about the usual things that count, the, the, the more obvious options that councils turn to, which are infill projects and redevelopment projects. Um, doing an uh, infill uh, council house building um, is never straightforward because you're building on an environment that people live on. So everybody puts their hand up saying they want a, a, a council to be building council homes a uh, few elect to have that construction site right next to where we live where they live so we have this approach as part of what we call the great estates program which is all about celebrating council housing celebrating our state estates turning them into prized spaces in the city uh, what we call the expand and rich framework and that means essentially finding new opportunities to build new council homes and pursuing every which way uh, through uh, major works investment and through soft improvements uh, to improve the look and feel lived experience of our estates and the estate improvement plan approach is really important because it, it's partly about making sure that there's an uplift in everybody's living environment um, uh, aligning um, investment in existing homes alongside new homes uh, and it's also really important in terms of residents having really strong influence over the wide range of improvements they'll see on their estate be it painting and lighting gardening and food food growing public art projects um, uh, you know waste infrastructure upgrades um, allotments you name it that we, we we throw as many things into the mix as, as we can and we also have a lot of resident influence over the design brief um, often selecting the architects um, and even in some instances there's one uh, schema I'll, I'll, I'll touch on here where residents signed off every design stage all the way up to the planning process because that's the level of involvement they wanted and actually move through the design process a lot quicker than many other schemes which there's maybe an interesting tale in that um, the other piece as well that's just worth touching on as part of this expand and enrich uh, approach um, is restate, restating in, in, in black and white terms uh, the circumstances for any redevelopment proposal of council housing. Um, in previous generations you saw a lot of estate redevelopment that saw a loss of social housing, a lot of displacement um, and, a, and, a, and an approach where the full value of a, of a, of a council asset wasn't being realised for the benefit of uh, that council's uh, residence. So, our approach that we've we've locked down in policy is that we always have to have a significant net increase in council homes, a right to remain for all residents who are rehoused to keep communities together. Otherwise, what's the point? A huge deepened des, uh, involvement in the design and consultation uh, with residents, and when it's a comprehensive redevelopment, we always have uh, require a positive ballot and a whole range of um, uh, different ways from workshops, one to ones, newsletters, surveys. Um, uh, lots of residents training on the different aspects of development uh, to keep residents really involved. Obviously during the pandemic we've not been able to have as much face-to-face -face involvement as we would have liked um, but actually strangely enough sometimes the online tools once people have got used to them um, can be even more interactive and actually even more convenient for people with different commitments uh, joining in uh, than we, we found uh, previously. Um, and so far there's a couple of estates along the Old Kent Road um, that are uh, going through this process. We've begun with whittling down surveys of different redevelopment options before uh, we finally land on a preferred option that we put to a, a straightforward black or white yes, yes, no ballot. Um, and the Tustin Estate will be doing that um, early next year. Um, we also, when we deliver new council homes, make sure that they're for people who live in the immediate area. So our approach to local lettings uh, not only uh, ensures that we go up to 100% local lettings where people are vacating homes in lettable condition. So to maximise the chain of benefit you get from every uh, home that's new home that's built. But we also pre-allocate those homes. We have a policy that um, a few weeks after the building works begin, uh, residents get a, a choice over all kinds of finishes in their home. If it's bathroom and kitchen tiles, flooring, painting, um, you name it, it should be the same for council housing uh, as it is in private off-plan off, off housing as well. Um, and 
with it with this mentality as well we're absolutely militant about design quality um it's incredibly important that council housing is at least as good as as good as if not better than private housing simply because i think once you start uh, restoring the prestige of council housing you, you can start building the wider case for a, a bigger role in, in councils delivering housing um, as part of the overall quantum of development that comes forward um, we've, we've got design review panels and um, we have a new architects framework that we set up with the london housing consortium uh, that has uh, 30 new practices uh, who've never been on um, an architects framework or had public sector um, jobs before we're also doing an expansion round um, of that framework to make sure that we have a, a better diversity of architects uh, involved. It's a predominantly white and middle class profession and we want to try and uh, be part of the solution to, to change that. Um, and we also have set up um, what we call the Dare to Design programme in partnership with Open City um, to bring as many Southwark teenagers into our design challenges as we can and provide really good routes into the architecture profession. Um, and just here are not necessarily the best pictures actually I could have provided, but on the left, this is under construction now. This is Meeting House Lane in Peckham by Howard Tompkins. Uh, that should be complete uh, hopefully late later this year or early next year. Uh, the middle one is um, Bell Phillips, um, Albion Street in Rotherhithe. Really you know, groundbreaking, beautiful uh, council housing um, that will provide, we hope, um, you know, spacious, light, durable, manageable housing. Uh, for, our, for our residents. Um, it's also really important that in our efforts to tackle the housing crisis, we're also trying to tackle the climate crisis. Um, often um, efforts to tackle one can counteract your efforts to tackle the other, so we want to try and um, make sure that's not the case. Um, we have requirements for all our council home schemes now where the operational energy, the energy efficiency of all of our projects has to be in the top two EPC ratings. We're always looking for new cost-effective ways of introducing new heat store, energy efficiency, renewable technologies, linking them into big infrastructure projects that provide heat. So we've got, we're very fortunate to have a, a waste um, incinerating, energy generating uh, plant on the Southwark Division border, which we're looking to expand. And we've got some uh, significant ground source heat pump uh, projects um, in different parts of the borough as well. And further to that, um, it's also important to never forget the embodied energy of new buildings we're eager to bring forward new form low impact low waste forms of development which i'll touch on when we get into the frontiers um, but that really means trying as far as is possible to wean ourselves off concrete and steel which have huge carbon um, uh, impacts uh, along their supply chain uh, we're not helped with the building regs at the minute when it comes to bringing forward properly fire safe engineered cross laminated timber uh, projects. We have gone from being the most permissive to the least permissive building regs uh, environment for timber building in the space of two years, um, which is quite frustrating and there needs to be a better dialogue with government to ensure that we, we have proper fire safety uh, tests on different building uh, methods and materials. And alongside this, we need to just be promoting reforestation options um, throughout Britain um, in the Greenbelt areas um, to create a new timber industry because we we don't really have one we haven't had one ever since Henry VIII completed his navy and and got rid of what was <laughs> what remained of the, the large forests in, in Britain and the final bit to say as well just on this is that uh, when we're talking about tackling the climate crisis we're also uh, talking about an ecological crisis and there's a lot of um, biodiversity right under our nose in in the city and it's important that we accompany every project with a nature recovery plan we always have a net increase in tree canopy coverage we're always looking for new ways to create new habitats bird boxes bat boxes insect houses and we work with a number of groups to uh, develop that piece of work as well um, this is the numbers bit that people are quite rightly um, interested in, in in Southwark because it's important and useful to set targets and try and meet them because it is a housing emergency there are many people in housing need and we need to get these homes completed but not rush them in a way that uh, compromises the, the durability and, and manageability but uh, to date of our kind of generational push for 11,000 council homes um, we're on track to get to around 3,000 or so um, by 2022 either delivered or on site it's been obviously significantly um, frustrated by the pandemic where many sites schemes that were going to start on site 
did not. So they were delayed by several months and the projects that were on site, uh, the volume and pace of work slowed down as uh, the contractors were, were following um, the public health rules. Um, you said this was the largest <laughs> programme in Britain, Toby. Um, I'm, it's, I, I think Birmingham might have another idea about that. Uh, there's different ways of measuring it, but we're certainly going um, full pelt. Um, and in terms of accelerating, uh, you know, we've built up a uh, development operation pretty much from a standing start. We're now like a medium sized housing association in terms of the range of roles uh, that we have across the development piece. Um, we're bringing in new funding, obviously, from HRA borrowing powers, uh, from the GLA grant. Uh, we're keen to um, uh, explore creating a construction vehicle that's better embedded in the development process so that we can at once embed better embed kind of ethical, proper labour standards in the construction industry, build our local skills base um, and crucially speed up delivery so that we're on site hopefully uh, weeks, weeks after a planning permission rather than many, many months, which is the norm through uh, public sector procurement practices um, today. Um, and alongside accelerating the programme, we're expanding the programme. So getting to <laughs> the bit that Toby <laughs> is eager for me to talk about, um, you know, we're active on over 120 sites now. Um, we are putting new infill sites, um, sites that we've bought, uh, sites that we're extending, rooftop sites uh, into the programme all the time. We've got another 30 or so that I'm hoping will come into the programme within the next few weeks. So let's have a look at some of these so-called frontiers. Um, so one of them is to work really closely with faith organisations. So we set up a housing and faith working group with many different faith groups across the borough, uh, the Southwark Citizens Network of Community Organisers and uh, the local diocese. What we basically said to all these different organisations is, uh, let's have a conversation about the wide range of housing services that your congregation needs uh, let's talk about the moral dimension of the housing crisis and let's let's partner let's be part of the solution together and there's been an amazing response we've present, kind of offered ourselves as a development one-stop shop so any aspect of development we're happy to uh, work with different organizations and we've got a really good dialogue now with a number of churches this is slightly out of date actually it's a bit more than this uh, but there are five partnerships of actual schemes that will be happening that have already been unlocked in all parts of the borough. I've got a good conversation going with a mosque in Camberwell. Um, and we think that there's a potentially really big opening here. Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury um, in his Reimagining Britain um, uh, uh, work a couple of years ago identified the importance of affordable housing um, and has, has set a kind of task for many of the different dioceses to uh, get their own house in order first and then they can preach to government about um, the importance of, of doing more to meet uh, the country's housing needs and we've got a great mapping exercise that we're just beginning in Southwark on that. Um, the other bit as well that is sometimes unintuitive to so many people who see how lopsided the, the land trading system is in Britain um, is that we buy new land to build new housing estates. In Southwark we are blessed with an incredible legacy of of land holdings um, going back uh, uh, you know, 150 years, but with a lot of new land that came into the, the previous uh, metropolitan boroughs in the interwar period. And then obviously after the Second World War with um, the new compulsory purchase powers that came forward, um, there was a lot of land assembly that took place. And that's part of the reason why we were able to have a really big program, but we're trying to do that again now um, the key factor in all of this is that we have a land compensation code um, that uh, enshrines in law the speculative premium, the hope value um, of, of a given site, uh, which in terms of the viability of schemes coming forward just simply means less affordability, less infrastructure contributions um, and less scope to have human scale development. So we desperately want to reform that. We've been campaigning for affordable land, for affordable housing. Um, alongside Shelter and, and many other organisations who, who are pushing this agenda. And crucially, we've been keeping an evidence base um, in Southwark of how existing use values and real world uh, land transactions have these huge discrepancies. Um, a lot of development value lost to landowners who don't do much really. They sit on, they <laughs> haven't really contributed a lot of the value um, on their sites. Um, Another kind of slightly more unusual frontier is, is, is looking at roads. So roads are obviously very important. They're 
central for permeability through uh, the city. Um, but certainly since COVID, but before then even, there's always been a priority to move to more, more walking and cycling. Um, and there are some instances, certainly in a borough like Southwark, where we've got a higgledy-piggledy medieval street pattern, that there are just bits of road where, you know, you've got kind of infrastructure in this case, uh, right next to Southwark Tube that have just cut across sites. Um, and, you know, we think there are actually quite a few opportunities in Southwark and throughout London and elsewhere to um, replace roads with council housing. Um, and often roads are owned by the council. Uh, in this instance, this is a scheme I'm really proud of that's had so much community involvement. Uh, this is at Styles House just next door to uh, Southwark Tube. Also really strong partnership with TfL. Um, where we were able to um, enable this project through uh, a land swap. Um, but these are 25 new council homes that should be getting planning permission, uh, hopefully all things going to plan any day in the next uh, few days and weeks. Um, that's on the site of Jones Street, which we've deleted. There's lots of opportunities um, like that um, throughout the borough um, and certainly everywhere I go around London. Um, one that's sort of not so much of an opportunity for Southwark, but I think could be a great opportunity for public sector organisations working together. Um, it's just around building over railways. Um, so when you've got deep railway cuttings, you often don't notice them, but there's lots of development on top of railways. Um, on the left there, you've got Dalston Square um, by um, Dalston Kingdom Station, Hackney, uh, the Royal Mint Street scheme um, that's just sort of northeast of um, Tower of London. And you've got smaller scale projects in more suburban areas like at Peabody Hill in Norwood. There are only marginal opportunities in Southwark, but it, I think there are uh, great opportunities on that front um, in terms of looking at pre-allocated, pre-windfall uh, sites that might, might uh, lend themselves to council housing. Um, we've got Apex here, um, uh, other rooftop uh, innovators, so there's clearly a lot of interest in this. Um, I was told the other day we don't have the largest rooftop housing programme in Britain, but in Europe. Um, I don't know if that's true, um, but we have, uh, we've gone really strong on this. Uh, it's really, we have hundreds of structurally sound flat roof blocks with, you know, potential for clear, secure access. And when you're building one or two storeys on top, there's no significant amenity impacts. And we are kind of leading the, the pathfinder for how you unlock these types of sites at scale. And crucially, the central question, bring residents on board. Um, you know, and, and the key driver for this is that you can preserve the embodied energy and carbon of existing buildings. You can prolong the life cycle of council blocks. It's a lower waste uh, form of, of construction. Uh, you can accompany it with uh, all kinds of energy, uh, thermal efficiencies for the existing building. Um, We've already got a number of them underway, including on the right there, a mega project at Meiju House overlooking Southwark Park. Um, but the, the key to unlock this really is uh, to adopt some re proper development principles that are all about maxim maximising the benefit and minimising the impact to residents. So we've got a number of principles, three kind of core uh, drivers for every um, rooftop project we look at is that we build off site. So we're on site for the briefest time and we minimise the nuisance to residents in the host blocks and hopefully minimise um, uh, the, the uh, surveying and inspections that take place before. Um, uh, that we have first dibs for residents who live immediately underneath, whether they're on the tenants on the register or whether they're leaseholders, so long as they're moving in a like-for-like -like fashion um, upstairs and they retain uh, the value of their equity, they don't pay rent on any difference but obviously there's a title charge that's if there is any difference in value um, that's kept for the council and crucially that we accompany it with improvements to the existing block uh, with a guarantee that any new roof lift or landscaping would be non-rechargeable in both the tenants and leaseholders service charge. Um, it's not straightforward doing this but to date we've had really good dialogue with residents um, there's a, a kind of natural anxiety uh, I certainly would have if someone came along saying I want to build homes on top of where you live, uh, but we've had a really strong dialogue um, and many residents see the benefit of this. And it's also a way for, to do estate regeneration, um, to invest in estate, prolong its life cycle um, without demolition or, or, or rehousing. Um, this bit people always sort of scoff at when I first talk about 
uh, tell, talk about it, but um, it is a real work stream of ours. So we're also blessed um, geographically in Southwark by having uh, a great stretch of the river. We've got the upper and lower pool between Tower Bridge and the Lewisham border. Uh, we have our own boatyard at South Dock Marina. Um, in the context of expanding and upgrading that boatyard, as well as the Canada water regeneration, uh, it's being led by British land that will be adding many thousands of people to the, the Rotherhithe Peninsula, as it's sometimes known, um, as well as the completion of the Thames Tideway super sewer, um, which in theory will reduce the direct sewage outflows into the river by over 95%. Uh, we are gifted with a new river. It's a key moment in the history of the Thames and a great opportunity to think about the habitat development that we could bring forward uh, the new kind of recreational community retail uses we could have on the river and yes potentially residential as well um, the reason we don't think this is daft is because that top left picture there we've already got a successful residential community um, in the Thames on our stretch already at Tower Bridge Moorings it's 40 boats over 100 people uh, different ages and backgrounds um, uh, they've and, and crucially there's an accumulation of learning about how you do uh, building safety, fire safety, um, that's a, um, a development that, a development or a community, that, a floating community that, that doesn't have a, a wash barrier. Um, we would uh, look to particularly create um, floating breakwaters on the edge of the navigable channel, creating a structure between that and the foreshore uh, where all of these um, things can potentially come forward. This is a, one of many destination points for a strategic partnership and dialogue that we're having with Port of London Authority and the crucial thing here is to make absolutely sure that we are um, framing this uh, explicitly to democratise access to and use of uh, the river. Londoners are pretty much cut off from the main natural asset of the city. Um, we see a great opportunity with the climate crisis, housing crisis and the need for a green economic recovery as well as the PLA's uh, plans for a green port um, to, to potentially bring forward a significant amount of housing on the Thames. Um, I won't go into, into too much detail. We had a scene setting event uh, uh, two or three weeks ago uh, as part of the Totally Thames Festival um, and we'll be starting a, a, a public visioning exercise and um, engagement plan uh, later this year. It'll hopefully be a really exciting uh, project. Um, this one's still undisclosed, uh, Frontier Number 7, sorry Toby. Um, but maybe we should uh, speak a bit more openly about it because it was touched on in an event last week. Um, I think some councils uh, are better enabled to bring forward uh, the potential of their sites than others simply by dint of um, maybe political circumstances or uh, the expectations they might have around how residents would respond to higher density development uh, in their area. Um, the, the long and short of this is that I, I'm just eager that different councils, house building councils, talk to one another and have a good open dialogue about whether they can share um, uh, their development expertise um, and pull the benefits, pull the resources, pull the risk um, and hopefully bring forward as much affordable housing uh, as is possible. Um, I was told that um, in the sort of near-ish Cardiff, um, uh, in kind of Bristol, South Gloucestershire and um, those parts um, out west, uh, there are there is a, a quite a bit of a mutual interest uh, of councils looking at uh, buying sites in each other's boroughs and, and potential partnership working there. So I think that's really promising. But we've got a burgeoning council house building movement in in Southwark, and um, I'm eager to talk to all the neighbouring boroughs, particularly those a bit further out, like Bromley, uh, to see if there's opportunities to work together. Um, so. Just to summarise, this is all about partnerships, uh, but it's also about utilising the in-house capacity that we've developed um, to enable those partnerships. Uh, Leather Market CBS, that's a community benefit society born out of a, a successful TMO in our borough. Uh, we now are working on nine uh, different sites with them. We've got uh, good partnerships with British Land, TFL, as I mentioned. We're talking to housing cooperatives. We're working with arms house charities, uh, bringing forward CLTs. Uh, there's other landowners who have not really been thinking about house building uh, for many decades um, uh, who are now interested to talk to us. Um, and, you know, in terms of unfurling all those different routes to 11,000 council homes, in terms of land delivery capacity um, and unlocking resources, um, it's all um, set out in a document called the Roots to 11,000 um, 
which was a cabinet report we passed last April. But I think no one's read, <laughs> but they should. I'll put it in the chat box perhaps. Um, so that's to, to sum it up really, and we're really proud of what we're doing. Um, you know, this, this is um, pictures, you know, we have launch parties at, uh, at, uh, for every completed scheme, uh, principally to make sure that residents get to know each other and start off on uh, the right footing, but also to give, um, you know, builders, architects, officers, councillors, residents, uh, a great opportunity to celebrate uh, new council housing. We've got lots of uh, launch parties um, coming up in the next few weeks and months. The bottom two left images are of a, of a touring exhibition we have about the history of council housing and philanthropic housing in Southwark that has been very popular. Um, and uh, crucially, we've got it all up on a website so you can track uh, the timeframes for each scheme and how the designs are evolving and resident feedback is coming in. So um, that's the sum of it. I'll, I'll end there. Thank you very much indeed, Leo. You, you absolutely ticked all the boxes that I was hoping uh, you would do, apart from the one on timing uh, and the promise that you made Sorry. me <laughs> that it would be 15 minutes. So we're, we're overrunning, viewers. I apologise. But um, I, I thought that the, the content that Leo was, was presenting to us there was, was well worth um, uh, watching, well worth breaking the, the schedule for. Some, some really uh, interesting, uh, intriguing ideas. And uh, Linda, um, a, a, a sort of a, a direct reference to, um, to your work as well. Can you, um, while I get your, your slideshow going for you, um, perhaps you'd like to respond to, to Leo's point about um, uh, working cross-border cross with your neighbouring councils and, and whether or not there's any, uh, any substance to that. Uh, I can, um, at this moment, I would say, uh, not a great deal, although I have a meeting set up with the neighbouring local authority to talk about it. But I think very often um, they don't have the ambition to build in the same way as we do. And there's a, a bit of, um, I guess, in Wales, because we've got the Welsh Government as well. And Welsh Government is placed in Cardiff. There's a little bit about um, resentment to Cardiff. And so there is quite a bit of resentment about working with Cardiff, but I'm hoping that we can actually break down those barriers because um, there's huge opportunities for all of us if we're working together. Fantastic. Well, there, there's something for, for Mike to come back on uh, once we've heard your presentation, uh, perhaps something about uh, governments collaborating, uh, never mind councils collaborating. <laughs> and thank you for inviting me and I'll try to take you through a quick canter through um, how we're delivering our capital ambition of building um, 2,000 council homes, which seems very small compared to so that This actually outlines uh, what our strategy is. So our strategy is not just about building council homes, but actually making sure that through the LDP that we're able to deliver um, homes uh, both for sale and, and for social housing. But my focus is clearly um, about social housing and really trying to lead the way in Wales. So I've set a target of delivering a thousand new council homes by May 2022, and there's no guessing why that date is there. Um, and, um, but we also have a long-term programme to deliver over 2,000 council homes. But throughout all of this, we've wanted to set new standards for council housing and to try and bring the private sector along as well to improve their, um, the, the quality of their homes as well. So we're working collaboratively, collaboratively with partners to try and do this. This shows you how we're delivering, um, and I, I won't labor this too long, but you can see that how we're delivering it is through um, a partnership build, through the council building, and the partnership build is the Cardiff Living Scheme. We're also doing partnership deals. Some of our housing associations have the ability to develop, but actually don't have the, the finance to build. So um, housing associations are building and we're buying those properties off them as council properties. So it helps us to speed up um, our build program. Um, and also buybacks, because very often, we need specific homes in specific places. And sometimes it's cheaper to buy back um, and perhaps sold council homes because we have the history of those homes um, and it's quicker than developing. So um, there's our projected timetable and you can see, and we actually have um, the capability of delivering 2000 new council homes. We have that land. We started in 2010. Um, 12 to consider how we could build council homes. The problem was in Wales, 
um, that we were stuck with the, the government's uh, housing revenue count subsidy scheme. It took a long time to buy that out. So the only way we could deliver actually, because we couldn't borrow uh, to build from the housing revenue count, was to go into partnership, um, which was a really, it, it, it's an amazing uh, avenue to, to go along, but it took two years to set up. So it was quite frustrating, um, but it is delivering and it's not just delivering, it, we're, we're building um, 10 year neutral properties. So all the properties on an estate will look the same, whether they're council or homes for sale or shared ownership. Um, the developer at the time was concerned they wouldn't sell those homes because predominant, predominantly um, we were using home, houses that housing revenue count owned on council estates. Uh, and actually all of those houses ended up being sold off book and all to local people in those areas. Um, but we, the difference between the private and the council, uh, they look the same from outside, but the council are actually larger because what we wanted to build as well were homes that didn't need to any major adaptations if people become disabled and could be changed for um, whatever um, comes across families' lives. So, uh, as I said, um, a program has to, to develop 2,000 new council homes, but it's not just about addressing housing need, it's also about addressing other issues within the council. So um, in terms of older people, uh, we've got older people who very often bed block in hospital simply because they can't come home to their homes, they're not suitable. We have people who are stuck with the bedroom tax um, who won't move because the flats we've got are too small and not suitable. And so we're building um, much larger, larger um, flats, um, which are um, care ready flats so that people can stay in them for the rest of their lives with plenty of storage space. We're also addressing issues in terms of um, care leavers. So uh, building a, a, a hostel where we can provide support to make sure that those individuals are ready um, to move out into life on their own and that they're supported and uh, into work and all sorts of personal support, as well as homelessness. And in terms of um, children's services, because very often, um, most local authorities face the same problem. Social services are overspent um, every year and it's because very often they're buying expensive services out of county. So part of our building is to address those issues too. So the, uh, in terms of the homelessness, uh, everybody's been suffering. We managed to get homelessness down, rough sleepers down from an average of 96 to 36 before the pandemic. Um, because we were embarking on a different program. So uh, the slides here show you a building we've acquired um, to open up uh, an assessment centre. Uh, and on the right hand side uh, is modular build, which is cu they're currently build being built to go in the car park to provide emergency accommodation um, while individuals are being assessed to make sure that we have a no first night out policy. Um, beneath that is not a very good picture because they don't look like that. Um, we apply to Welsh Government for uh, in a, from their innovative funding scheme um, to take on containers. Um, and the idea was to provide temporary accommodation for families on meanwhile use sites so that um, when they're not ready to be developed, we can put them on there and then when we're ready to develop, we can move them to another meanwhile use site. Um, they, um, it was really frustrating. That took an awful long time too, uh, about 18 months. And I thought it was meant to be quick. Um, but by the time you go through the procurement process, it makes it complicated. Um, they were ready to be um, for people to move into in March and this was family accommodation, um, which was quite opportune because when we had lockdown, actually we kept them vacant and we've used them for homeless individuals to actually self-isolate if they've got, if they contracted the virus. So um, we still haven't used them for family accommodation, but they're there. So uh, talked about care ready housing. So um, uh, we're providing homes for life 
um, which are adaptable and flexible uh, and able to adapt around a person's changing need uh, and re reduce the requirement for future adaptations, um, but future-proof to enable care staff to operate from the building. So it's high quality accessible communal spaces, including roof gardens and roof allotments, um, so that we and providing a hub for older person and collectively together with health service because the health service is also building um, a health centre uh, on that site as well. So um, we've also got a scheme uh, in collaboration with Welsh Government um, to build passive houses both for sale and for rent and this is about testing whether there is an appetite for people to buy um, uh, energy efficient homes uh, and so we're in partnership with we're doing it with the Cardiff Living Partnership and in partnership too with um, uh, Cardiff Metropolitan University Research Project. The, we've got planning permission for 2,214 homes um, and I won't read all the way through that but they're, they're 44 care ready flats, 21 two and three bedroom houses um, developed through the Cardiff Living Programme. We were due to start on site in March 2020. Um, unfortunately, COVID has delayed that and I'm hoping they're going to start on site very shortly. Um, but it is um, making sure that we achieve um, th those energy rate ratings. Um, and actually, um, to try and make sure this, this works, we're in discussion with mortgage lenders about a green mortgage so that because the, the added cost to homes for sale is around, in, in Wales anyway, is around 10 or 11,000 pounds. And so we're talking to mortgage lenders to take account of the energy cost over the life of that property um, so that they could uh, lend more on this. And, and there's some, um, we feel that there's some merit and, and they're taking that on board. Also as part of, of that de uh, development, um, we're putting a, uh, we were managed to get some funding from SUSCAP um, to set up a training centre. So it will be a modular training centre um, so that once that work is complete on that site, we will move that modular, that modular building to another site. But the project outcomes are to provide 750 unemployed individuals to become site ready. 750 college students provided with on-site work experience and 225 site-ready individuals gain sustainable employment, 65 of which will be from underrepresented groups. So it's not just about building those houses, it is also about trying to address all of those other issues as well. This is a regeneration programme uh, which is in my ward. The boot shape um, red line is um, Cancel housing, it's on the edge of a park, wasn't that very well developed, but there's subsidence. And so um, they need to be demolished. Um, the, the larger site on the left-hand side is an old gaswick site, which we have um, purchased. And as you can see, the green arrows. Um, so as part of this development, what we're trying to do is actually to link up um, those two sites build a bridge across the river from um, the park to um, a, another park and um, a wetland reserve. But this actually provides um, better walking and ac access for walking and cycling. So we're trying to address that. So this gives us the opportunity and we're, we've been out uh, consulting over the last six months. Um, we're going back to the residents um, next week on consultation on the outline plans, but uh, a full application because on site, um, we've got a high rise block, which was designated for older people. Um, and after, um, um, sorry, I've forgotten the name now, I shouldn't forget it anyway, but after the fire, um, Clearly, uh, we had concerns and that high res block only has one stairwell. So what we've decided is to make it part of this development and demolish, um, but it was um, mainly older people living in it. So as part of it, um, 
we're going for full panel permission for the older person's accommodation so that we can get that on site as soon as possible because they're really keen. But what we are looking at is um, green walls, as I said, uh, roof gardens, roof allotments, um, and making sure we bring some of that park that was on the edge uh, of the estate into that estate as well. So what we're talking about is making sure um, they're renewable energy, uh, heat source networking, um, and also looking at actually um, ways to, better ways to dis for people to dispose of their rubbish, because there is a huge problem already on that estate where people do dump. Um, and so we're gonna try that on this estate and on the Gatswick site. Um, when both sites will deliver almost a thousand homes, not all, because as I said, we're building mixed 10 year estates and 10 year neutral, so that uh, you would know if you were in a council house or a private house. And I think that's the end. And I hope um, that was um, useful. Fantastic, thank Linda, thank you so much. That was, that was really great. Now viewers, you'll know um, if you're regular viewers that um, I'm very strict about timing and I, I'm very, uh, I, I treat your time as precious. I know you've all got jobs to go to and, um, and you know, more Zoom calls to make. Um, but I, I do think that um, the material we've heard uh, this morning has been absolutely fascinating. The, these sort of rich examples of councils actively exploring new frontiers in, in, um, in delivering the homes that we need. Uh, and so I'm going to uh, indulge us uh, and continue uh, the conversation slightly longer than we normally would. Um, Linda, would you respond to a few of, uh, of, of the um, innovations that, that Leo mentioned? I mean, for example, you showed us a picture of the, the river there with the sort of green arrow going across it. Um, w w why go across it? Why not build on the river? Is that, is that something that's, that's uh, appropriate, feasible in, in Cardiff? It, it, I found it really interesting listening to Leo's um, presentation because um, there were lots of things that... Um, clearly Southwark have thought about that, that we haven't. But I guess Cardiff is not so constrained with land as Southwark is. Um, we do have this issue in terms of um, people wanting a green belt around Cardiff and not wanting it to expand. Um, but we, we're still not as constrained as Southwark is probably. So I guess we haven't had to think about um, building on the water or across the water. <laughs> and what about um, uh, Leo's comment on, on faith groups? Have you explored partnerships with faith groups as a, as a way of unleashing uh, new homes? I mean, two, 200 homes in, in Southwark, that seemed to me, that was more than I expected to, to, to hear about. We, we have previously had conversations with faith groups um, and um, probably the last time was probably about two years ago uh, and it was a difficult conversation. Um, but I, I think, I, um, as I said, listening to Leo, I found it very interesting and probably worth going back to to look at that. I was going to ask if you'd send me his presentation, actually. Our, so mission, that, our mission is accomplished. Excellent. We, we, we're convincing councils to share expertise and, uh, and best practice and, and, um, and find new ways of, of delivering homes. I'm Absolutely. delighted to hear that, Linda. Um, viewers, all of the presentations will be shared. The whole video is going to be available to you online within about 24 hours. Uh, from now so don't worry about that also if you've asked questions and you can't stick around to hear the answers uh, our panel very kindly agreed to, to respond by email to any of the questions so we'll circulate those through our, our LinkedIn group and you'll be able to catch up on those if you've got to rush off to your next Zoom call um, but first um, uh, Mike we've heard some fantastic uh, examples of, uh, of local authorities uh, exploring new boundaries in, in delivering homes what, how do you respond to that can you see um, the, these initiatives forming part of, of, of your policy can you could you imagine pushing these forward under under your your government if you if you should assume power yes I, I, it was it was interesting in terms of the, the the ambition I mean first of all I want to say uh, uh, thank you uh, to Leo and and and, and Linda You're doing an absolutely fantastic job I mean you know 11,000 the target um, um, Leo in in your patch I think it's two two thousand uh, Lind Linda and yours which I referred to the less than 6,300 bill um, um, last year. So that shows you why government has really got to step up to, uh, you know, the, the, the current government, but any um, incoming Labour government in the in the future. And the key there is, is partnership, isn't there? I mean, Leo touched upon, and, and, and Linda yourself, the, the issues around land. 
and that hope value as well. And it's it's something that that fundamentally has got to has got to be addressed, which will drive up drive up build and bring down costs even even, even more. But that partnership and that collaboration with people at the heart of of, of regeneration, they're, they're, they're key messages that 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 are coming through. Of course, that that dual crisis, the housing crisis, and the and the climate crisis. And I think the, the government needs to step up more in terms of uh, as, as assisting uh, councils up and down the up and down the country to to respond to that. You know, so you spoke about in the innovation there in terms of the green green mortgage. I think it's a brilliant a brilliant idea. You know, there's there's more that certainly central government can do in partnership. Great stuff, thanks, Mike. Um, Philippa, you, you're you're one of the the, the sort of key drivers in uh, in all of this with your your rooftop housing uh, uh, program. Um, can can you tell us a little bit about how widely appropriate that would be, and and perhaps talk a little bit about what it's like to be a disruptor in the development industry at the moment? Um, because it seems that there are there are huge forces at work that have maintained uh, the level of delivery that, that we've seen over over recent years, uh, and it takes uh, it takes uh, quite strong forces to move those. Yeah, um, and like you say, I think you know it's the cost, isn't it? So the lack of housing supply um, at the moment is not kind of the building itself; it's the land upon which it sits. So if airspace can unlock this barrier and take away the land cost. And, you know, whether that be on, you know, existing homes, whether it be on car parks. I know Leo mentioned Bromley and I know they're there building some houses on stilts on a car park there. Um, you know, whether we start looking at offices and retail and, you know, build above that or convert what, what is already there. But like you say, with some research that was undertaken, you know, there are about 180,000 um, airspace homes that could be built across London. And at the moment, we're only doing, I think it's 2% of development is actually using um, upward only extension. Now, the new planning regime should hopefully help that. But what airspace development does enable is, you know, a quicker route to, to development, um, at a reduced cost. You know, you can use modern methods of construction um, to build them. They can be less disruptive for the residents in situ. Um, as Leo says, it keeps communities together, you know, existing infrastructure is already there. Um, and it's bringing homes to where people want to live um, and where their jobs are. Um, you know, people don't want to necessarily commute an hour to work or, or longer and take three buses or whatever it may be. So being able to put the, the homes where people want to be is, is really important. Um, so the potential is there, but the planning system is nearly there. It, it still needs some tweaking. You know, if you're refurbishing the existing blocks, you know, does that need a new application? Can that all fall under the, the PDR regime? You know, scheme we're actually doing in Southwark, but for Lambeth and Southwark housing, which actually goes to committee next week, is actually combining two blocks together, which, you know, needs a new roof already so it's helping out with those maintenance repairs it's putting bookends on the end as well so trying to utilize the site as much as possible as well as putting a lift in um, which residents don't currently have and like you say enhancing what is already there um, and you know the, the other big blocker is obviously you know the procurement route itself um, and I don't think this is a problem that you know has is ever going to be easily solved but you know the, the two slowest things to any development is planning and procurement um, so if those two things could be simplified and speeded up um, you know development can happen a much quicker I'm going to leap leap in there and, and point out that the, I think it's 220,000 uh, granted uh, planning applications for uh, housing that have yet to be built out. So it's not necessarily the planning system that slows down development in, in every case. Uh, but I take your point, Philippa. And also you raise a, an important point about modern methods of construction. Um, now, uh, friends of, of, of the Voice of Authority, uh, Mike Diaf and Mark Farmer have produced a report on um, how they would go about using modern methods of construction to produce, I think it was 180,000 uh, homes. And that, that report was produced a few weeks ago. We've got a, a launch event for that uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, Mike, what, would you support uh, modern methods of construction uh, broadly as, as, as a government? And, and, and what sort of backing would you, would you give it? What sort of force would you give it? And then also I'd like to tie into that a question around, as a layman, I, I, I see these things as, there's an argument that you're either building houses for sale or you're providing grant in order to fund um, uh, houses for, for social rent. 
um, would, would, would a Labour government substantially increase the, the grant funding that would be available to, to local authorities to, to build housing? Yes, I mean, I'll answer the, 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 the last one first. Um, no, uh, we, we would, yes. So it'd be, uh, I've said the government are putting a, a, a considerable resource at the moment. Um, um, 12 billion the affordable homes program but it, it it does need to be it does need to be re, re, reconfigured I, i'd love to help the likes of uh, linda and leo and many colleagues up and down up and down the country and you mentioned their um quality and mo modern methods of construction and you refer to mike who, who i have i've have, have spoke to, to, to mike as well um, um yes i mean that quite naturally responding to the of the climate and uh, housing uh, emergency i think that's that's got to be, I know the, the current government uh, are looking at scaling up and there is partnership with Homes England, I think it's Urban Splash as well. Um, um, and um, uh, they've uh, bought a major stake in a Japanese um, 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 manufacturer and, and basing it here. I think we mentioned there in terms of the um, skills required um, um, both now and in, in, in the future is ma ma major opportunities here um, um, to, to upskill the industry build homes safely and, 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 and responding to that carbon carbon zero uh, agenda. Uh, Leo, you touch upon uh, building houses out of concrete and uh, using too much concrete and steel. Well, here's, here's an example, isn't it? Really? Yes. Yeah, Leo, um, you, you, uh, what sort of um, role would, would MMC play in, in, in your programme? Are you, are you making specific efforts to, to, to source uh, factory built housing or mod modular housing? Um, yes, so uh, it's not the the comprehensive solution because when you have standardised uh, parts and modules, that doesn't always lend itself to standardised sites, of which there are none in Southwark, um, just the nature of the borough. Um, but you know, one of the projects I showed you, the the over road one, um, uh, is a will be a modern modern methods uh, project. Um, also, in terms of the rooftop housing, you know, we're looking to do as, as much of that building in factories at speed uh, with hopefully higher quality um, as well. We've kind of signed up to um, uh, one of the LHC uh, modular frame building frameworks for that. And obviously we're talking to other rooftop builders, um, constructors who can potentially help us uh, bring those kind of methods forward as well. So and we're also looking at um, home, uh, uh, emergency homeless uh, options like the one that uh, Linda's worked on. I'm keen to learn a bit more about that as well. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating stuff, isn't it? We've got, we've got enough material here for a whole day's uh, conversation. Um, Linda, you wanted to come in on, on uh, off-site construction. On the modular build, yes. I, um, I, I've tried to rush through the presentation, but the, the Rumney High School site where we're providing the training as well, that's all modular build. So, and actually it's supported by um, the Welsh Housing Minister, Julie James. So she's trying to um, set up nationally um, a modular build factory in Wales to make it much easier for local authorities to use it. Fantastic. Well, look, um, we, we are, are seven minutes uh, over our allotted time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you have the last word there, Linda, uh, and allow our viewers to get back to their, their jobs and, and Mike and, and Leo and Linda and Philippa to, um, to get back to theirs as well. Um, but uh, what, a, what a great um, unveiling of, uh, of interesting ideas from 200 homes being um, uh, put forward through working with faith groups, um, the acquisition of potentially land for potentially four new housing estates in, in London with hundreds of new homes on unnecessary roads that just the idea of unnecessary roads uh, gets me excited um, but providing 25 new council homes uh, railway cuttings maybe marginal in Southwark but but um, a more importance elsewhere the rooftops are providing 50 sites in Southwark already uh, in in possibly the world's largest rooftop house building program um, and uh, 700 homes on the Thames I mean you know, three years ago, we wouldn't we wouldn't have been even considering this. So it's absolutely fabulous stuff. And then the idea of of cross boundary working, which is something that that many people have been pushing for for, for a long time. Perhaps a glimmer of hope that that's going to be happening uh, in the southwest uh, and in uh, in the south of Wales. Um, but in the meantime, partnerships with housing associations, the provision of of whole lifetime homes, the acquisition of homes and sites for homelessness. 
um, to, to relieve homelessness, modular emergency accommodation uh, solutions, and the provision of uh, passive house uh, for sale and rent, and of course the provision of, of, of green mortgages as well. Some great ideas in all of that. Thank you very much indeed, uh, panel. Um, it's been it's been a, a really a really interesting session. Um, now I know you've you've kindly agreed to respond to uh, the questions that we've still got hanging from our, our viewers. Uh, so we'll get those circulated through LinkedIn after this session. Uh, but in the meantime, panel, thank you for sparing the time uh, when you're under so much pressure. Leo, your your childcare um, uh, responsibilities. I know uh, I, you know, onerous is the wrong word because it's always a joy, but you've been very kind to, to re rearrange those. And I know it's not just you that, uh, that suffers for that. So thank you to your family for, uh, for allowing you to take part today. Um, and, and thank you uh, to, to our, our whole, whole panel on behalf of our viewers. Um, thank you, Mike Ainsbury, MP, Shadow Minister for Housing and Planning. Thank you, Councillor Leo Polak of Southwark Council. Thank you, Councillor Linda Thorne, of Cardiff Council and of course thank you Philippa Prongay of Apex Airspace without whose support none of this would have happened. Uh, most of all thank you to our Voice of Authority viewers, thank you for hanging on for so long uh, today, uh, we hope that uh, you found it fascinating and, uh, and compelling and we hope to see you again a week from now to discuss the future of the Great British Town Hall with Roger Sturck Harbour and Partners and Inner Circle Consulting, among others. You can register for that and watch the video of this session and all our other webinars at www.thevoiceofauthority.co.uk. If you'd like to get involved in these sessions as a sponsor or as a speaker, please email me at toby at threefox.co.uk. We've got a session on great estates coming up in which uh, Leo's involved. Uh, if you'd like to explore that, let me know. Uh, meanwhile, from our panel, from me uh, and from everyone at Three Fox, good afternoon.